Welcome to the Sharp 600, brought to you by Covers.com. I'm Rob Cressy, and I'm super excited to be jamming with you. And joining me on today's show is Frank Schwab, senior NFL and sports betting writer from Yahoo Sports. You can follow him on Twitter at Yahoo Schwab. Frank, great to have you on the show. What's going on, Rob? How you doing, man? I'm doing amazing, and you and I recently connected on Twitter when I saw the sports betting connection that you had. I was like, you know what? I want to dig a little bit into Frank's sports betting mindset as well as chop it up about everything going on in the world of sports from NBA to NFL. Uh, so I want to start with this. Sort of take us into the mindset of how you think about sports betting in approaching it because as I was saying before we started – I got better as a sports better when I understood the process about how people um, thought about sports betting. What are they looking at? Because uh, picks are going to come and go. But if we can teach someone how to fish, it's going to serve you a lot more in the long run. Oh, I, I totally agree with that. And I think a first tenet that I always remember just about every day is it's hard. This is, you've never mastered it. You've never figured it out. You've never had an angle that's going to work 100% of the time. It is hard. I don't care. Like, maybe there's a few people on the planet who this is easy for, but it, you got to keep on it every day. You got to grind. You got to know, you know, what teams are, you know, rising and falling, what teams are, you know, where, where injuries are coming from, motivation. I, I mean, like the last week of the NBA bubble, regular season wise. You, you're handicapping just who, who's playing hard, who wants to play, who cares, who, you know, who, who's throwing out a, a decent lineup or not. So stuff like that, you have to be on this stuff 24 seven, as far as like uh, approaches stuff I look for, I think the best advice I've ever heard. It, it, well, uh, some of the best advice I've ever heard is to bet numbers. You, you know, I, I, people get so caught up on teams, but you know, even we look at like, you know, a team that the Lakers, let's say, you know, they played really well the last few games. I'm just going to pound the Lakers. Well, maybe their value is not there in the next game because the books are adjusting. The, the books are always adjusting. They're, you can't stick with the same thing because the value comes and goes as far as, you know, you, you can't just say, I'm going to bet this team every single time out. No, that doesn't work that way. There's value. I, you you got to bet numbers. And I like to use all the tools, uh, you know, there are. I, I don't, I'm not just an underdog better, although I lean that way. I'm not just a motivational better, though I, I always check the motivation. I'm not just an analytics guy, but I like the numbers. So I think there's different tools in your toolbox. And you kind of got to use them all, right? Like, I mean, you can't, you can't just get stuck in one box because this thing is hard, like I said right away. I, I agree with you 100%. And I have tracked my last 1,000 bets, and I am hitting 52.7%. Like literally over a thousand bets. So when you say this is hard and this is a grind, I always chuckle when I see those we're hitting it as 60% plus clip um, type of posts out there. Can it happen over a small sample size or a season? 100%, but I'm a multi-sport better. So it's not just NFL, it's college football, it's NBA. And I sprinkle in golf and UFC and MLB and all of these different things. And you're right in terms of fundamentally, how do we do it? One, I want to continually get smarter and find the right sources that I trust. God knows I don't, I can't just look at every single game and immediately know what's going on, but that's where data comes in. That's where finding the right experts and analysts who might have liens that can be confirmation for you. You might be thinking something and then all of a sudden you see, Hey, here's Frank who I respect his opinion. He's also on this side. Sometimes it can be that simple. Um, we aren't going to have all of the answers, but I think what we want to do is be a more informed better. So you want to look at the tools you have at your disposal, but at the same time, do not get information overload. Why? Because Twitter is a plethora. You're going to find someone who's on the Lakers and someone who's on the Blazers, someone on the over, someone on the under. Someone is always going to be right on Twitter. Someone is always going to be wrong on Twitter. So how in the world do we go and sift through all of this stuff? And that's where you understanding the things that are important for you when evaluating a game. So here's something I'm curious on for you, though. For NFL, I think it's a little, or college football and NFL, it's a little bit easier to understand value because of key numbers. Looking at 
threes and sevens in the over under totals. But when looking at something like the NBA, your Lakers example, so the Lakers could be minus nine and a half or the Lakers could be nine minus six and a half. How can a casual better look at that and say, what is value as opposed to seeing that number at minus five and a half for the NFL? You know, and a lot of it, I think a lot of it is feel, getting used to this. Like, like you, I, I bet every day multiple sports and all that kind of stuff. I, and I think there's some, you know, there's some sports that have great information out there. It's like college basketball. Like, I mean, Ken Palm has become the go-to, right? Like, if I go to Ken Palm and I, I see that the line's off, like, you know, four points or something, which is rare anymore, you know, that kind of confirms it for me, right? But I think it's just, I really do think it's just knowing every day, you know, this team maybe – playing better in its last 10 games or so. I mean, we're all dealing with small samples, but I remember specifically the Harrison Barnes year at North Carolina. I remember having them, like the, the number was really, really off against Wake Forest and they covered. And I, I watched the game really close and thought, this team, is, something's clicked with them. This is a different team. The analytics are going to catch up to that because the analytics are dealing with the first 20 games of the season, right? And I pounded North Carolina the rest of the way until the, the lines kind of caught up. And, you know, I had the same with the Atlanta Hawks. I remember the Atlanta Hawks had that great run five years ago, six years ago, was it now? It was on with the four, all, four, four all-stars? Is that the team you're talking about? Yeah, the, the one that cov- they covered like 18 of 19 at one point, And the lines never really caught up. But that's just knowing from betting it every day. They're saying, you know, Atlanta's been covering, you know, at this point, what, 10 in a row – but there's still only minus two in this spot. I think it's just knowing it's just kind of having that feel for this line is off like a, a baseball game. Like, I mean, you could say like, you know, the Tampa Bay Rays are really undervalued here. They're a good, good baseball team. And just because they're starting pitcher, well, they, they, they're going to go with the whole opener thing, right? That's maybe why they're undervalued here. Stuff like that. If you're just in this every day and it's, you're getting reps every day. I think that that's how you spot value is just knowing it kind of, getting a feel for what the line should be and then seeing what it is. It's Covers 25th birthday. Covers is celebrating 25 years of making smarter sports betters on Sunday, September 6th. So make sure to follow them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about a great new contest they're going to launch to celebrate this big milestone. Also, follow hashtag Covers 25 to share your favorite sports betting story of the last 25 years. I also will give a caveat to this because sometimes you can look at a line and say, this doesn't make sense. And I want to say it was a USC versus Utah football game where USC was the last few years, they've been like a 500 slightly better team. And here's Utah, this ranked team. And all of a sudden uh, USC is favored by three. And you're like, well, wait a second. They're unranked taking on a Utah team where you sit there and you're like, someone knows something that I don't know. So there's two schools of thought. This line is off or wait a second. Sometimes there's a deeper level thing that I don't realize. And I think that's one of the things in sports betting that I'm always trying to get better at is what is the thing that is not baked into the line that I need to recognize? Because like you said, motivation, Vegas knows about motivation and zigzag theory yep. and Injuries. trends. It's a huge one because, you know, everybody's like, oh, the quarterback's hurt. I'm going to bet against them. Vegas, they've adjusted the line. Like, and and it's a great, actually a great spot is betting on a team their first game when, after the quarterback's injured because the line's all, all, all screwed up. And I actually heard a, a good quote this week. I want to say it was regarding the uh, Lakers-Mavs matchup where Doc Rivers said teams – typically let their guard down when a star player is out. So for example, heading into game four, Luca was questionable on if he was going to play or not. So all of a sudden he had to make sure to guard his team against the fact that they're like, you know what, this is going to be an easy game. Whereas naturally as the betters, thankfully I didn't make the bet, but it was looking at Clippers minus seven all the way up to Clippers minus eight and a half, because how will they do um, if Luca's not there and, or how effective will Luca be? And it wasn't until I heard it from the mouth of Doc Rivers that said, that's what we need to be careful of. My perspective on what to do when a star player is out has changed forever because of what he said. Yeah, absolutely. Stuff like that. And again, like going back to the quarterback example, same thing where you think, Oh, there, there's no way team, you know, the Kansas City Chiefs are going to win because Mahomes is out. 
the line has already been it's been adjusted like vegas isn't like what matt moore's starting i didn't know so i think that for sure and, and just different there are different, you know, situations like that where you're like, you know, you gotta, you have to understand that Vegas knows all this. They're not, not surprised by anything. It's just knowing sometimes how to, how, his line shifted too much is, you know, and, and one thing I try to get ahead of, and I, I'm still working on it, I'm sure you are, is getting ahead of line moves. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you think, oh, everybody's going to pound the, the Chiefs over the, the Houston, Chiefs are a public team, Patrick Mahomes and all that. And maybe it goes the other way and you're like, I really misread that room. I thought it was going to go the the other way. I think that's something I'm, it's a constant thing. It's an everyday thing, still working on this and learning and trying to figure out again, line moves. Like I, that's something I'm still trying to master. And sometimes I feel like a genius. Oh, Hey, I got on this team at minus four. And now it's, you know, minus six and a half. Some days I, I I'm like, okay, that line's going to move this way. And it moves the complete opposite way. It's still a learning process. And here's a good exercise for that. Look into what time you're making your bets. So look into my current sports betting consumption with NBA games starting, let's call it 1%, 1 p.m. Central time by 11 a.m. my time. I need to have my bets in. But you really need to start thinking about what time are you getting bets in from a line movement. And I know when I look at the college football or NFL seasons, um, those you can look a little bit, you can look a week in advance a little bit more on where the lines are going to move. But we always don't have all of the information so now you're going on what you truly know about sports betting lines and where you think things are going to go as opposed to let's call it the casual Sunday better where it's Sunday at 10 a.m. and you're setting your fantasy football lineup and oh by the way let me sprinkle some jelly beans on some sports bets and that line may have moved a few points one way or another so I think that's an interesting thing to do is look at what time you're doing and if you just want to get better at this just sit there and find a few games and say, all right, well, which way do I think this line will move? And imagine just tracking this and understanding a little bit more. And then depending on which way it goes, say, all right, what did I not see about this? And really self-evaluate yourself. And the more you're willing to learn in the name of improvement, the better fundamentally you're going to be. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it kind of comes back to what I talked about at the jump is, being humble about this not not you're never going to figure this out i mean look there, yes there are a few guys on this planet who are just masterful at this and god bless them you know i i like to think of myself on the high end but we all think of ourselves on the high end right we all like to think we're smart we all like to think we got this figured out but you never figure it out and yes sometimes like a line will change and say i'm just like i never saw that coming why didn't i why was i on the wrong side of this line move or you know, you talk about like looking ahead. I think that's a really important thing, especially like NFL, because you could see something like recency bias. If a team comes out on Sunday night football and just looks terrible, the line might move a couple points. You know, if you're, if you're in tune with that, if you're preparing for that, you can get ahead of that. You can take advantage of that sometimes. Stuff like that, it's, it, it, it really is a lot. I mean, the more preparation you put into this, the more you're going to get out of it. It's just one of those, you know, I can go, but the casual person can go play in a poker game and that's fine. But if you don't know, if you don't know what you're doing, if you haven't studied the game, you're going to lose. It's, it's the same with sports betting the time you put into it, not just, not just studying teams or players or anything like that, but studying the whole concepts, the, the, the bigger concepts of you know, like, like zigzag theory. I mean, everybody kind of knows that by now, but if you don't, if you're casual better, maybe you don't, maybe you don't understand. You're going to look and say, Oh my God, the, the Mavericks beat the Clippers. How are the Clippers minus eight today? I, I'm going to go back on the Mavs and not understanding, you know, uh, some theories like that. Yeah, and I think that's interesting because one of the things, you mentioned you bet dogs, and one thing that I've preached on this podcast is get comfortable being uncomfortable. So right. I like to zigzag certainly in the NFL when a team has a great performance or a terrible performance, because we have recency bias. If we see a team win 30 to nothing, or if we see a team get blown out 30 to nothing, we are more likely to be like, this is what we're going to see again. Is it comfortable to bet against the Chiefs the week after a blowout? Zero percent. Is it comfortable betting on the Lions after they lose 30 to nothing? Zero percent. <laughs> but guess what? There's a reason why there are giant casinos in Vegas. Because if sports betting was easy, we would all be printing money, and that is not the case. So that's just one simple mindset thing that I have. Like you going through your sort of checklist, I say, all right, well, where are the games where there was a blowout one way or another? Because that's 
that's where we might be able to see some perceived value because the general public is going to say they're going to keep on rolling or they're going to keep on being terrible. Yes, and, and the NFL is just ripe for overreaction because we – dissect the NFL through the week like nothing else like the NBA you got a couple of days we're gonna talk about how great Luca is for a while and then you know you're gonna play a game 48 hours in the NFL every game seems like the end of the world or we're gonna win a Super Bowl and it's just it's just not that way the NFL is an incredibly competitive league you look at college football and it's not it's no big deal to see Alabama favored by 39 points if you see a double digit favorite in the NFL you're like whoa really like it's so I think the NFL is just – the NFL is the most popular sport, obviously, and we talk about it all the time, and it makes it tough because those lines are so tight. They're so the, – the, the, Vegas ain't giving any money away in the NFL. So to figure out where the overreactions might be, you know, are the public – if somebody at the Cincinnati Bengals come out and get blown out on Monday Night Football, is the line going to change two points? Is, is it, or is it just, hey, I don't want to – you're going to be uncomfortable, like you said. But you also have to think about – well, maybe the Cincinnati Bengals are just terrible. Like, sometimes that does happen where a team is just awful for six weeks. You have to – I mean, it's all, again, preparation, putting in the work, grinding to figure out, okay, can I fade this, uh, this favorite who just – you know, the Chiefs are just one by 42, or is this the start of something else where I, I don't want to get in front of that train? So I want to talk about something that during the NFL season, live betting was probably my biggest victory of the year of something that I was newly exposed to. And it was an ongoing narrative because I felt that there was better value once the game started. And during this NBA playoffs, once again, I've been doubling down back on the live betting. And it's something that I want to share sort of my thought process, process on how I'm doing it because I feel like there's a greater edge from a value perspective. So numerous times this postseason in the NBA, while I'm watching games, or even if I'm not watching games, I'll just follow the live betting lines. I'll look for when a favorite is down, where you might be able to get a little bit of um, extra juice. So here's a great example of this is Clippers Mavericks. I believe this was game one. The Clippers were down 14 points in the second, and I was able to get them on the live betting line at plus three and a half. Within two minutes, they went on an 8-0 run, and boom, that number jumped up to Clippers minus three and a half. So naturally I wouldn't do this, but for the sake of this podcast, I wanted to do it. So you know what I did? I ended up taking the Mavericks plus three and a half on the other end to create a, a six or seven point middle opportunity. While the Clippers ended up covering uh, minus eight or so, it came down to the last minute. What it did is it really gave me an opportunity to say, look at the betting variance that was just created in a two-minute span where the Clippers went from being favored by eight to being down 14 points in the second to going uh, on an 8-0 run to boom, the Mavericks are now underdogs. And Another example of this, the Bucks were down 12 to the Magic. Boom, all of a sudden, the Bucks got, went down to plus seven and a half. Unfortunately, that one didn't work out in my favor because not every time is the live betting going to work. But what I really want to share is being on the lookout for these opportunities. Another great example, the Heat were down seven at the half to the Pacers. Boom, their line moved to plus one and a half. They came back and won that game. So there is so many more opportunities post the original line posting for us to get better value in the NBA. And I'm curious, is live betting part of your flow at all? It absolutely is, and it's been something I've incorporated. I can tell you when it started. I was out – I go to Vegas every year for March Madness, and I didn't have, you know, live betting available to me, but I did there because, I, you know, the apps or whatnot. So I'm sitting there, and I remember it was the Michigan-Oklahoma State first round game, if you remember that one. And it's – I think it was that game anyway. And I, it started pretty slow. Like, it was like, you know, at the first media timeout, it's like 8-2, to two, and the over-under came down. You know, I mean, it, it, maybe it started at – I mean, it was a it was a high scoring game, so it was like 170, and it was like 156 at the live line because of this. It's only four minutes of a basketball game. I took the over; it ended up being a thing of 92, 90 type of game, and it went way over the total. It, it, it was it was like this epiphany of the line kind of overreacts. These algorithms look all these casinos; they're using algorithms. There, there's not one guy in a room saying, "Oh, okay, I'm going to bring that." No, it's it's all computerized. They can't keep up with all this, and I think a big one too 
that I've tried to use, and it doesn't always work, but, you know, especially on the lower game, not the NFL games because they're going to take things down if Patrick Mahomes gets hurt. But if you see an injury, jump on the other team. The, the algorithms can – we're talking about an NBA regular season game. Algorithms aren't always going to catch up to this. I remember I did this recently. I wish I could remember the game. But somebody got hurt, and it was like, okay, I'm going to jump on the other team now. Or, you know, if you're doing a baseball game, and a, a, if Max Scherzer is already at 60 pitches through three innings, I don't think the algorithm can really, you know, account for that. And, you know, their bullpen stinks, so, hey, I'm going to take the other team here. I'm gonna, maybe going to get value. I think if, you, if you're paying close attention to a flow of a game, foul trouble in basketball. Like I said, pitch counts in baseball. Injuries, obviously. I think you can really find value because, you know, you look at these live lines and I'm sometimes shocked by how much the line changes just play by play in football. We're talking about like, you know, you could have a team minus six, they give up a 25 yard run. I was under minus four. Like, it's like, what? Like that, there's no way that one play shifted the line that much. So you could find value. I think just, just being aware of the line has shifted a little bit too much here when we still have three quarters to go. And I feel like it's calculated bets on my end that you're looking at it and you're like, well, I've got more value than where the line opened at minus four. And now I'm getting it at minus one or plus two and a half. And as a better, I feel like I have an edge for the exact reason that you said, because we're watching and we understand sports, whereas the algorithm is non-emotional about it. And I think the ultimate example of this was the Chiefs in the playoff run, that oh, we yeah. continually saw them down in the first half of every single playoff game. And it was like, well, wait a second, they can come back like this. And I heard a nugget about the NBA that I have not forgotten. It said the, the Rockets are a team that starts slow. Well, why is that of note? Well, we know that the Rockets can score 12 points in about four seconds. So I am continually on the lookout for the Rockets being down in this series because there's a huge opportunity for, boom, this change is just like that. And all of a sudden, you can get these wins under your belt a little bit better where you're like, wait a second, I'm now sitting with the Rockets plus two instead of a, a Rockets minus two line. That makes all the difference. Yeah, and there was a game last night, a baseball game, uh, in Minnesota, Cleveland, and Minnesota fall down one zip pretty early my eight is on the mound and i've loved backing him got him on plenty of my fantasy teams whatnot so i know minnesota's still minnesota there's they're down one run that's not a big deal but the line jumped to i think i, I ended up getting cleveland at a, or i ended up getting minnesota at about plus 160 and, and, you know if you told me before that game started i'm gonna hand you the twins plus 160 <laughs> okay here's a mortgage payment you know i mean you're giving me such great value so, you know, being down one run, I mean, sometimes that's not going to work out. Sometimes, you know, I think it was Savali on the mound. You know, sometimes he's just going to shut the Twins down. It's his night. But if you told me before, like, I always think about it in those, in those terms of if you give me this line, like you talked about, like the Houston Rockets at plus three and a half before the game, would I take that? Yeah, absolutely. It's great value. And if there's enough time left in the game, things are going to kind of come back to the mean. So, yeah, I do think that, Taking a team, it's a little scary because sometimes you're taking a team, hey, I'm, I'm down 12 to 2, and you look up and, uh, you know, you might get blown out like the Portland Trailblazers last night. You know, I mean, they maybe just don't come back. They don't got nothing that night. But I think that that's something that comes with experience too. And you're going to take your losses, but I think more often than not, you're going to find value in live betting. Exactly. And a great example of that is Toronto, Brooklyn. So this exact thing, I'm, I'm following it and Toronto goes up 12 to two and Brooklyn goes from plus eight to plus 12. And I was like, I'm just going to sit on this for like another minute or two. And then like 25 <laughs> points later by Toronto, I'm like, thank God I did not jump on it. But to your point, guess what? We only have to win these bets 53% of the time. So often we all feel every game, every win and loss, like it's the end of the world. It's like, oh my God, I lost this bet. Nah, be unemotional about it. Think of it as roulette chips. Hey, I feel like I have more of an edge right now getting Minnesota at plus 160 when they were favored to start this game. And I believe over time, I will hit it at 53% clip if I do this. Right, and it's, you know, again, this is a tough thing, and it's all about the small edges. I mean, it might not sound like much to go from whatever the Twins were before the game to plus 160 or whatever they were down one zip in the fourth inning, but those add up. I, if you keep doing that enough times, you know, over it might, you know, one game, yeah, the Twins maybe get shut out that night. Yeah, I don't win. But over time, if you keep taking good teams that should be favored, favored pregame, 
all of a sudden I'm getting them at plus 160 and are only down a run. There's still six innings to go. Eventually those add up. Eventually you're going to win those. You're going to win more often than not, I think anyway. And you're going to the, – the small edges at half point here, half point. I think that that's something that, you know, it sounds like micromanaging, but it's really not. Like, I mean, this is something that I think we, we agree to. But not everybody really thinks about it of, oh, the, the, the Clippers are minus eight. I could have got them at minus seven and a half, uh, you know, an hour ago, but there's no big deal. No, those half points add up. You know, they, these things do matter. And it, maybe you think you're, you're crazy, like, you know, you're grinding over a half point in a basketball game, but you always want to get the best of it. You, you, if you get the best of it enough times, you'll end up, you know, winning more often than not. As someone who lost a Lakers over under by a half point this week, you're preaching to the choir. But imagine if I got those extra four points because the game started at eight, two and a little bit slower and all of a sudden, boom, that number goes down and that's the edge because how many times do we say you could be watching a UNLV Fresno state game and the over under is 71 and with one minute left in the game, one of the teams is driving to make that either 72 or the under and you're like how did vegas know well guess what how did vegas know is something we say all the time so if we can get a few points in our favor at any point guess what that just gives us a little bit of breathing room from how did vegas know yeah no doubt i I mean there's there's so many times when it's and especially nfl i mean we're we're, you know i mean that, that is the most popular sport half points are enormous like if you can jump on the chicago bears at minus two and a half on monday don't wait till Friday when it's minus three and a half because yeah, I mean, that's a key number. Obviously we know the key numbers by now, but it just seems like not enough people really, like you said, a lot of people, and that's great. It, look, it's a hobby for many people. It's a hobby for me for most part. And you know, you wake up on Sunday and you're like, Oh, I want to bet a game because it's going to be on my TV. It's going to be on CBS. But you're really not thinking about value. You're not thinking about line moves. You're not thinking about all this kind of stuff that if you want to be a successful better, it really, you need to, you need to check all these boxes with just about every bet if you want to get ahead of it. So Frank, as we wrap this up, here's what I'm curious about from you from an NBA standpoint. If you're going to rank the four teams that I believe are the best for the title, Bucks, Clippers, Lakers, Raptors, how would you rank them right now in terms of your confidence? Because the Raptors have looked the best. We've seen a slight kink in the Bucks, Clippers, and Lakers. And, you know, I, I have to be upfront about this. I was born in Milwaukee. I'm a lifelong Bucks fan. This is the first time they've ever been favored for anything in my lifetime. So a little bit of bias. But I'll say, I wrote about this before the restart. I thought the Raptors were the best value. I, I got them a 22-1. to 1. And now they're down. I, I don't know what they are at the moment, but they've looked great. They play. They're not your typical NBA champion profile because most NBA champions, if you look since about the late 70s, most NBA champions have a, a, just a huge star, right? They have a, a guy who's a no doubt Hall of Famer. I don't know that Kyle Lowry's that guy. Like, I don't know if Siakam's that guy, but Toronto does so many things well, and they've been in this spot. And I think they were undervalued most of the season because people just said, oh, they lost Kawhi, they're going to go away. And that didn't happen. It is a pretty well-coached team. So I think value-wise, Toronto has a ton of value in my mind. I don't know. Everybody else has flaws. I don't know that the – Maybe the Bucks have turned a corner, but their defense was terrible in Orlando. I mean, after being the best defensive team in basketball, they're terrible in Orlando. I mean, just awful. So have they just flipped the switch and they're going to get going? Maybe. It's, it always happens. As far as the Lakers and Clippers, I, you know, I hate going against LeBron. I hate it. Like, it's, he's just one of those guys. That he's the – you know, he's the bad guy in the, in the horror movie where you, you need to see the body. Like, I mean, if he's got any chance at all, you, you're scared of him the whole time. So of all those four teams, I like Toronto the best still. I said that a month ago, got in on him good at the, at the value, I thought. And I'm going to keep riding that. I think Toronto is just one of those, in this weird year that, that everything's kind of upside down, maybe the norms don't fit. I thought something odd might happen in the bubble with no home court advantage, none of that. I think Toronto as good as anybody. They, they just play really good sound basketball. I agree, and they remind me of the Detroit Pistons when they won the title. Unsexy team, good on defense right there. I think you can still get the Raptors at plus 800 to win the title, and even if they make it to the finals, you could then hedge that thing out. And every episode, we typically like to give some sort of lean or bets 
But I think really what my call to action for today is, is to play some live betting because I think right now that's where I see the biggest opportunity for us on a day-to-day basis. You with baseball, as you mentioned, me with the NBA side of things. Frank, do you have sort of a call to action or something that you want to leave everybody with? Oh, man. I, you know what? I'll, I'll throw this out there because it, it, it's a futures bet. I know futures bets are sometimes square, but if you can get Dak Prescott a 14-1 to 1 to win MVP, go do that. Because I think he is going to – I am investing heavily. I, if you want to give me a, you know, a play, a lean, I love Dak Prescott to win MVP this year. Dallas Cowboys quarterback, so he's going to get all the attention. He's going to put up 5,000 yards. The Cowboys are going to win the NFC East. All the boxes are checked. Don't go chalk on MVP. Take, take Dak and just enjoy that future bet. Frank, really enjoyed jamming with you. Where can everybody connect with you? Yeah, like I said, hit me at Yahoo Schwab. I'm always on there and I love talking sports gambling because it's out in the forefront now, right? Like we, we're not in the shadows anymore. We don't have to do this privately. We're out there. We're talking about gambling. People love doing it. I remember when I started, first started covering the NFL 20 years ago, gambling was taboo. You didn't write about it. You didn't even talk about it in media rooms. Now we're all out there. We're having fun with it. I can't believe I'm sitting here in 2020 saying I'm covering sports gambling for Yahoo, writing about you know, the, the Jamal Murray bad beat the other night and, you know, with his shot he hit. It's just so much fun. It's so great to just have this kind of platform now where it's just – it's mainstream. It's everywhere. I live in Colorado. We, I can – I had three different apps on my phone I could bet right now. It's, it's just so great to see how it's changed and how it's – it kind of evolved. I, I agree with you 100%. Sports betting has been an absolute blessing. And I want to hear from you. Let us know when you do a live bet – How did it go and what was your mindset for it? Make sure to tag us all. You can hit me up on Twitter at Rob Cressy. Make sure to use hashtag sharp 600 and be part of our community and also make sure to tag at covers. And I want to give a big shout out to everyone who's part of our community who subscribes rates and reviews on iTunes. It helps us so much with discovery, bringing new people in. And remember when you give us a shout out, we will show you some love on the show. And remember, if you want to be a sharp, don't be a square with your bankroll. Be disciplined with your money management.